All right. So we are in the third and final installment of a, of a sort of overview of the book of Ruth. Uh, we engage today in um, the final chapter of it. Um, I'm going to give you a quick rundown because I know not all of you have been here for um, the whole series. It's been a three-week series. And so really what happens is you find in, uh, in the first teaching we did in the opening of the book, it's famine and heartache. There's a famine in the land of Israel. So Elimelech. Uh, his wife Naomi and their two sons, Melon and Killian, they go off to Moab. And they live in Moab for a number of years, upwards of 10 years. And um, in that time, Naomi's husband, El- Elimelech, uh, Melon and Killian all pass away and they die. And she's left alone with her daughters in law. Orpah, her other daughter in law, returns to Moab. But Ruth stays with her and goes back into the land of Israel. Where, um, where we kind of unpack the theology of pain. Do we have room in our life and in our belief of God that this world has pain in it and God, though he has saved our souls and given purpose to our living, he hasn't done away with pain. There's still pain in this life. There's still hurt in this life. And God, is there a theology, a redemptive theology that allows for pain? And we say, yes, there must be. Then the second kind of installment of this is when Naomi and Ruth return, and it's harvest time in a land that's known famine. And Naomi uh, stays home. Ruth goes out and gleans in the fields, and she runs into um, a man named Boaz. She gleans in the fields of Boaz. Uh, Boaz is the bachelor of the day in Bethlehem. He's older. Um, you, can, you can infer from the text that he might have been Elimelech's uh, uh, brother, so he would have been the uncle to Melon and Killian, and um, he is the kinsman redeemer to this family, and he takes care of Ruth, and we find, uh, we find them, we'll talk about their story and their, their interplay a little bit of, of what goes on there, but we find ourselves from famine and heartache to harvest, and now we jump ahead to redemption's legacy. There's a legacy in redemption and something that goes on in this book that tells us you should read the Gospels understanding the Old Testament. You shouldn't just discount the first two-thirds of the Bible and say, well, it's all about Jesus. It is all about Jesus, and that's why you should read the first two-thirds of the Bible because in the Old, the New is fully revealed. The, the new is concealed in the old through prophetic nature and stuff. And what we find in this story is the unfolding of redemption's legacy that will carry itself right up to Christ. So we're going to unpack and deal with redemption's legacy and some of the ethics that go with it and some of the realities we face within that. So what I want to do today is I'm going to take and I'm going to read um, Ruth chapter 4. You're not going to read along on the screen. I want you to hear this. When Erica was, uh, she was studying Shakespeare um, at one point and um, she would watch the Shakespeare movie, play, whatever it was. She took me to one at Michigan State and it was super apocalyptic and weird and I didn't like Shakespeare after that, but she told me that's not how it all is. But um, so we went to it, and but she would say you have to watch it and read it at the same time. Shakespeare is better performed than it is just being read. And all the English people went, amen, because it's true. Shakespeare is meant to be lived. It's not just meant to be read. You're supposed to have imagination and really engage it. So what I'm going to ask you to do is have some imagination with me. Even as I stop a couple of times and explain things, I want you to have imagination for what this felt with felt like. And I'm going to stop, and I'm going to scrub away the sanitizing effort we do with scripture and make it feel a little more raw. So um, so here it is. Um, chapter, okay, chapter three, just a quick brief overview. Um, chapter three finds Ruth at, um, at Boaz. She's put on, she did her hair pretty. She, um, she gets dressed up and she goes and lays by um, Boaz, who's asleep at the end of the grain pile. We'll talk about that later. And, um, and invites him to lay the corner of his robe over her. And there's a lot of significance in that, and we'll talk about it. Um, and, and he has said, okay, I'll do that, and is really kind of honored by this request. And we find ourselves in chapter 4. Check this out. Meanwhile, Boaz went up to the town gate and sat there when the kinsman redeemer, had uh, he had mentioned to, because um, he was in line to marry, uh, he's a kinsman redeemer. He would have been the closest relative 
to Ruth, uh, to Ruth's husband, her dead husband, but uh, there was actually one in between him and Ruth. So he went to the, to the closest kinsman redeemer. And when he came to the town gates, he said, come over here, my friend, and sit down. So he went over and sat down, and Boaz took ten of the elders of the town and said, sit here. They did so. He said to the kinsman redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from Moab, is selling the piece of land belong, that belonged to our brother Elimelech. I thought, you should, uh, I thought I should bring the matter to your attention and suggest that you buy it in the presence of these seated here in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, do so. Here's why this is happening at the city gates. The city gates are a place of the gathering of the elders. That's where all the important people would go and kind of hang out. So he's kind of gone to the courthouse, and he pulled together a few, you know, judges and important people. And he said, look, I'm about to strike a contract here with uh, the kinsman redeemer. You guys be witnesses to that. So that's what's going on here when, um, when he says this. So if you will redeem it, do so. But if you will not, tell me so I will know. For no one has the right to do it except you, and I am next in line. I will redeem it, said the man. Boaz said, on the day that you uh, buy the land from Naomi and uh, from Ruth, the Moabitess, you acquire the dead man's widow in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property. See, this is where we're going to scrub scripture. This says, when you buy the land, you've got to take her home. She's your new wife. How do you explain that? Hey, babe, I'm home. This is Ruth. She's, uh, she needs children. Yeah, you shouldn't be good with this. This would be weird. And, he, and so, so he says, once you buy the land, you also get the dead man's wife. And he's like, hmm. Doesn't seem so lucrative all of a sudden. He takes on, you know, awkward pause. So at this, the kinsman redeemer said, then I can't do it <laughs> because I might endanger my own estate. <laughs> you know what he's saying. I will die this very day a painful death, and you will all hear and witness it. All right, but it's his estate that he's worried about. I just, I don't know. I love the Bible because it's real. All right, um, you redeem it yourself. I cannot do it. I just love his anxiety. So there's a quick explanation in the text that says, Now, in earlier times in Israel, for the redemption and transfer of property to become final, one party took off his sandal and gave it to the other. This was the method of legalizing a transaction in Israel. It's a little footnote. So at this, the kinsman redeemer said to Boaz, buy it yourself. And he removed his sandal and Boaz announced to the elders and to the people, today you are witnesses that I have bought from Naomi all the property of Elimelech, Kilion, and Melon. And I have also acquired Ruth, the Moabitess, Melon's widow, as my wife in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property so that his name will not disappear from among his family or from the town records. Today you are witnesses. Then the elders and all those witnesses said, we are witnesses. May the Lord Make your, um, this, is, this is just really pay attention to this. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah. So Rachel and Leah are the wives, they, were, they have polygamy back in the Old Testament, uh, the wives of Jacob. And from Jacob came all, from Rachel and Leah are all the tribes of Israel. So Judah, Levi, Asher, Gad, all those tribes. So they're saying may you be blessed like that. Um, and together built up the house of Israel. May you have standing in Ephratah and the famous and be famous in Bethlehem. Through the offspring the Lord gives you by this young woman, may your family be like that of Perez, remember that, whom Tamar bore to Judah, R remember that. So Boaz took Ruth, she became his wife, and the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. The, wo the women said to Naomi, so the child's grandmother, who had lost her husband and two sons, Praise be to the Lord who has this day not left you without a kinsman redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you and who is better to you than seven sons has given birth. Then Naomi took the child, laid him in her lap, and cared for him. The women, the women living there said, Naomi has a son. And they named him Obed, and he was the father of Jesse, the father of David. This is, this is like incredible here. This is incredible what we see unfolding in this text. And what we have to do to give shape and form to this monumental event is kind of see what's working under the scenes to form it. 
something that's hidden, not from, it's kind of hidden from plain sight, but it's there and we just overlook it. It's, it's the, the biblical version of what I would consider Spanx to be, right? You know what that is? Oh, don't lie. You know what it is. You've been to weddings. All right, so um, I found out about these things. All the women are laughing. And they're like, what? And there was a lady wrestling with a garment, and she's like doing this. And Erica, my wife, she laughed, and she said, you know, I, I said, what's wrong? And she said, her spanks are off. And I'm like, what? And she had this thing under her that gave form underneath, smoothed everything out. Super tight. I guess it's a girdle for modern days. I wish they would make a myrtle because it would benefit me, but they don't. So a man girdle is a myrtle, and um, but they don't. But but it's this thing that's underneath that gives shape to what's going on. Terrible analogy, but I'm sticking to it. All right. So it's this thing that's going on. What's going on underneath this story that gives us a frame of reference for redemption's legacy? And I will tell you this: the 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 reality of it is the question. Who started it? Who is that person who started it? In Ruth chapter 2, 5, and 6, an unnamed servant makes a significant introduction. In his everyday ordinary life, he's doing his work. Ruth comes and gleans among the field. And um, Boaz comes, the owner of the state, and says, who's that woman out there gleaning? And he makes an introduction that Ruth doesn't realize the significance of. He says, oh, that, that is the Moabite woman who came back with Naomi to live as an alien in our land. And something in the heart of Boaz stirred. He made a significant introduction to her kinsman redeemer. She didn't know what field she was in. She just was out working. And in her work, this servant makes a significant introduction. It's a, it's a kind of a... It it leads into the redemptive ethic that says this. For you and I, we live under the same burden as that unknown servant that gave shape to the story that started the ball rolling. Not to just be like the servant. If he, What if Boaz had said, who's that woman? And he'd be like, I don't know, some widow who's super broke and needs some extra grain. That's a different story, isn't it? That's a different story. He made an introduction of Ruth. He said, oh, no, no. He wasn't like, I don't know, just some poor lady who needs help. No, he says, this, this is Ruth, the daughter of Naomi, the Moabite, who came back with her when she lost everything. He makes a significant introduction. And here's the reality. We are called to make prized introductions in our life to the great 29 times old, 29 times removed grandson of Boaz. We are called to be the servant who makes introductions to the kinsman redeemer. We are called to make known to God those whom we encounter, their names, their stories in prayer, and also making known to them who the kinsman redeemer is. We are called to live a little bit differently and in a little less freedom to to be like, oh, I don't want to make people uncomfortable. We're going to push on that later, but just get that thought out of your head. We are going to be uncomfortable. Do you live with the ethic to make those significant redemptive introductions because that's what gives shape to the story underneath. In chapter 3, we find that redemption has this kind of lasting ethic. So we find this introduction that happens between a servant introducing another person to their kinsman redeemer. But then we find redemption's lasting ethic begins to thread itself in a unique way through this story. Because we find at the end of the harvest, after Boaz has kind of taken a shine to Ruth, that something happens. She gets all dressed up. She looks super pretty, perfume, all this stuff. And she goes and finds Boaz, who is asleep at the end of the grain pile because they've had a harvest party. Okay, so he, he went and slept at the end of the grain pile. And he's asleep there. And she says to him when he wakes up, she says, spread the corner of your garment over me. We need to clarify theologically what's going on here. She's not like one of your children when they come in and get in your bed and put their cold feet on your back. You're like, hey, you know, and that, that's not what's happening. What she does is she comes and says, will you put the corner of your cloak over me? Will you take me into your house? Will you marry me? It's the first great flirtation on her part. She literally invites him into relationship. Now, I don't know about you. But um, I I super love when Erica flirts with me. Now, I hope you don't because that would upset me deeply. But um, Erica's my wife, by the way. Um, So so I love when I'm I'm like in a room full of people and stuff and I see her and she looks, she smiles. I'm like, 
I like you too. Like I see her kind of smile or she wink at me. I'm like, oh, I just like it. I don't know, something about that kind of brings me to life. I like that engagement. This is that kind of kinetic, electric engagement. Will you take me in? Will you hold me close? Will you protect me? This is so important because we, didn't, we don't know this in our culture, but in Jewish culture, Boaz had all the power and influence, but the one thing he couldn't do was initiate a relationship with Ruth because it would be smirch and kind of degrade the name of her dead husband. She had to pull the trigger. She had to initiate the relationship. Boaz was under oath not to do anything no matter how much he felt. So Boaz, sleeping at the end of the grain pile, gets this request, and he says, yes, I'll do it. I'll do it. And the lasting ethic of this, really, Boaz playing the Christ figure in this, the kinsman redeemer, can be, um, we can translate this to our life pretty easily. Because just like his grandfather, 29 times over, did, so Jesus does. Here's where it's critical. Jesus Christ will never force his way into your life. He is under oath that in the end, it is your decision to accept him and follow him or to walk away. He has everything you need to be redeemed. He's done everything you could imagine. Your life will be profoundly better, more peaceful, and and changed by the presence of him in your life. But Jesus lives under the same redemptive ethic that Boaz did. He will not force you to become a Christian. In the end, we have to choose to follow and receive what is his free gift. We have to invite the kinsman redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ, and say, will you spread your cloak over me? Will you take me in and be my Lord and Savior? And that's one of the things that kind of blows my mind in this. Think about that. That ethic is emerging here in this text. That ethic that will follow right through to this present day is emerging here. That God will not force himself on us. He is our kinsman redeemer. If we will, but choose him. So here's the reality. I, am a, I, I would say I'm more of a Lutheran Calvinist type. Okay? And, and that's good because I'm in a Reformed church. But there are other branches of the, of the Protestant church that lean far more to what's known as Arminianism, which is far more works-based salvation and um, everything's up to you. You've got to kind of earn it. I super disagree with it, okay? I super disagree with that theology. I think we should live transformed into Jesus, but we shouldn't be trying to put on a show that isn't really the work that's being done. So I am far more Calvinist, but here's the thing. I'm a Calvinist with an Armenian trigger, okay? I'm a little bit uh, separated in my theology because I believe in the sovereignty of God and God chasing us down, loving us, pursuing us, narrowing the gap of belief so that it's easier for us to understand and believe in doing all that work. But in the end, God has subjected himself by choice. His sovereign choice was to say, I will do nothing until you choose. You choose. And that redemptive ethic lives forward into this very day. Boaz's choice to remain faithful, to not break covenant, was rewarded when Ruth said, will you put the corner of your garment over me? That gives a lot of shape to this redemptive ethic. And we're starting to see it come clear in what God's about to do. So what we do here is we kind of turn ourselves and go, okay, there's this wonderful servant introduction and there's this amazing kind of lasting ethic that goes on in our faith. But, but then there's this really weird kind of dislocated thumb aspect of the scandal that is the family of God in Jesus Christ. But this is what I would propose to you. This is where we should take the most hope, is what goes on right here. I want to read with you. This is from the gospel, written by Matthew, who is a tax collector and a Jew. So he knows Jewish theology. He knows this stuff. Listen to this. I'm going to stop and unpack it. Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Ready for the bloodline of Jesus to get really strange right now? Judah had a son who married Tamar and died. Judah is the father of Perez whose mother was Tamar. Is anybody else putting Legos together? 
no, that can't be. That can't, what? Wait a minute, what? The bloodline of Jesus has that weirdness in it? That Perez is his son, grandson. Awkward Christmas. Really weird. How do we work this out, Grandpa, Dad? I don't know. What's going on here? See, what we don't understand, but God's trying to point out, is the fact that from the very rootedness of the family tree of Jesus is a brokenness, a systemic brokenness that only God can heal. So let's look at it. Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Awkward. Strange and awkward. Perez, the father of Hezron. Hezron, the father of Ram. Um, Ram, the father of Aminadab. Aminadab, the father of Nashon. Nashon, the father of Salmon. Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. There are very few women mentioned in the bloodline of Jesus. One of them was Tamar, who has a pretty weird family situation going on. And the next was Rahab. Anybody remember who Rahab was? If you weren't raised in the church, you've probably heard of the Battle of Jericho. And Rahab was a woman who was gifted at entertaining. (laughs) Yes, okay, you got it. I'm really working around young ears here. She was gifted with the entertainment of of humanity. And and that was, she just, yeah, and um, (laughs) super duper awkward. Um, So that's what she did. And she housed the spies of Israel. And she hung a scarlet uh, rope out of her window. And when the walls of Jericho came down, there stood in the wall her apartment, yet untouched. And she came out, and she was married by Salmon. During the conquest of Israel, the land, the, the promised land, she was married by Salmon, who is the father of Boaz. Now, you may have a weird kind of janky grandma somewhere in the line, but I guarantee she probably wasn't Rahab. Right? What's your grandma do? <laughs> that much. She's super weird. You know, like, what do you do with that? That's in Jesus' bloodline. Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. So we have weird family, weird profession brought into the family, foreigner. Foreigner. Obed, the father of Jesse. Jesse, the father of King David. 29 generations later, a child in Bethlehem would be born under a star in a stable named the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's his family tree. What does it say to you and me? What does this say for you and I? It says, from Tamar, Rahab, and Ruth to the teenage pregnancy of a little girl named Mary, scandal has been part of the bloodline of Christ. Why? Because God uses the imperfect realities of our humanity of the humanity around us around us, to highlight his desire to redeem what is broken. He is not highlighting a perfect family. He's highlighting a broken, profoundly broken family to show that he is ready to redeem all that's most deeply broken and quit pretending it's okay. How legit is that for you and I? How badly do you need that today? Because I'll tell you this, I can live in a faith that is represented by these kinds of people. But I don't know that I could hold my head up in some pious Christian corners of the world because I don't look the part, because I don't feel like I have it all together. This tells us this, that God is in the business of redeeming humanity out of its brokenness, even through its brokenness. And you say, you know what, I've, I've messed up too many times. There's too many, things wrong, too many things wrong with me. I don't know how to be a Christian. I will tell you this, Jesus Christ does. And if you invite him into your life by his spirit, he'll teach you, and you will become more and more like him and less and less like you. You will become the very image of him who you say you love. And how do we know this is true? Because the the ethic and the legacy of redemption is not built on perfect lives. It's built on some people who you're like, wow, that is a super horrible curveball to have that in your family. Not only is that, but there's Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, Mary, the mother of Jesus, all of it's scandal. So what do we do with this? How do we hold up the scandal and the agony of what's gone on in the life of maybe our families? So let's apply this. Let's look at how we can make this fit in our lives. The first thing is a charge to you. You need to become the servant who makes redemptive introductions. Always look for ways 
to introduce people to Jesus. And if you live under the ethic, and, and I think it's part of the Dutch culture, uh, Dutch people are very private by nature, we're not all Dutch, right? That's true, but we are being Dutched, you know, they repress us. Um, so I, I'm Scottish, I just want to hit people with a mace, and you people are like, no, we don't fight. <laughs> Cookie? No, I want a mace. Um, like, but we're being Dutched, right, in some ways. And it's a very private culture, and I would introduce them to Jesus, but I don't want to make them uncomfortable. Hell is super uncomfortable. Eternity without God is horrific. Stop excusing your inactivity with a religious tweak. You are the servant called to make knowledgeable, profound introductions that are redemptive. Start introducing people to Jesus every chance you get. And you're like, hey, I'm too messed up. So is Jesus' family. It didn't stop him. You and I need to start looking for ways to make this world profoundly uncomfortable. It'll do two things. First of all, it'll, it'll open our eyes to who's working in the fields around us. It'll open our eyes to who's sharing this life. And the second thing it'll do, it'll up our game spiritually and we'll stop acting certain ways because everybody doesn't know we're Christians there. But once they know who you love and serve, you're going to change the way you live because you're already putting out the feelers of making redemptive introductions. My friends, the first application is this. Go and introduce people to their Redeemer. If you don't want to do that and you want to be part of this church, and if you're like, oh, I don't want to do that, it makes people uncomfortable, you already have to leave because you made me uncomfortable. I'm uncomfortable with the choice of Christians who say evangelism's not my thing. It's not true. It's all of our things. The last words of Jesus, go therefore into all the world, make disciples of all nations. We better quit making excuses that Jesus doesn't allow for. The second thing is this, live above the scandal of your past. Anybody here have some shady areas of your past? Come on. Let's be like Baptists in the South. Uh, amen, right here. Anybody? Yeah, some of us got some crazy shadiness in our past, and you're like, no, no one can know about that for legal and moral reasons, right? You just don't want people to know what goes on. There's a reason I think God called me out of San Diego to serve in Michigan <laughs> because I don't think I could be a pastor in San Diego. I think they'd be like, no, we've heard. Like, they, they, I don't think it'd be allowed. But here's the thing. We need to start living above the scandal of our past and live according to what Jesus Christ has done for you. Just Stop. Real quick, we're going to stop, and we're going to remember all that Jesus has redeemed. What are some of the areas of redemption in your life? What have you been set free from? What have you been set free from? So I'll just be just kind of sadly honest here and pitiful. Um, I have tried to prove myself all my life that I'm worthwhile. And there's reasons for it, and I'm not going to go into that. But um, with that comes a significant amount of ego. You you. You're inflating yourself to make people think something. And um, God had to take my ego and fill it with candy and put children around it and use it as a pinata and just destroyed me emotionally. I was, I was horrified at how big my ego had gotten and God destroyed it. And every time it starts to come up, ego, whoosh, I invited God to break some things in me that were ego related. And now it's not that I'm shameless, but I'm just kind of like, look, if you're looking for a perfect pastor or shepherd, I just can't be it. But if you're looking for someone who will be like, oh, I did that too. I wish you would have asked first. Like, I, and walk with you, I'll do that. Because for me, I'm embarrassed of how much of my life was about Eric Folkers and how little it was about Jesus Christ. What about you? What about you? What things own you? Here's this little guy again. How many validations do we seek on this? Has anybody here ever just given up Pinterest? Somebody who's a Pinterest head, which is like a crackhead without a pipe, is, um, <laughs> is like, oh, no. No, there's a 28-day program for that. Walk away, right? Has God ever redeemed in you some of the things that, like, please just like me. Please just validate me. Please, please, please. And God, like through Lent or something, just says, hey, just put it down. Let, find your identity in me. Has anybody, have you been redeemed? Is there anything in you? And I'm not asking you to shout it back, but I want you to think about it. What's been redeemed? Maybe your sexual ethics. Maybe your honesty. 
Maybe you are just free from the fact that you were broken and wrecked and ruined and you're living in the new life you have in Christ and it feels brand new and you're free to be you. Stop living according to the scandal of your past because if that's how Christian life was done, Jesus would have been the first one to fail at it. But he didn't. He lived above the scandal of his past, of his family line, and redeemed everything that was broken. If it's broken in you, it can be redeemed because We live serving a kinsman redeemer. So finally, our third thing, and this is what I want to kind of put a tack in. Don't let your broken past define your redeemed future. You have a redeemed future that you are called to live in. And and I don't know about you, but if if you're constantly looking back and driving forward, no wonder you're getting in some really bad wrecks. I don't know why I can't grow in Christ. I just know the back in my past. No, face forward. Don't let your broken past define your future. Does anybody else here want a future in Christ where he is actually leading and guiding? The reality of this is that we have to make a conscious choice. It's a spiritual discipline to say no to your past. Otherwise, we could all be owned by shame, guilt, and all the brokenness. But we're not. We're owned by the kinsman redeemer. What do we do with a theology and a belief that says, ever since this started, there is a legacy of redemption that says, no matter how dark, no matter how broken, no matter how empty, I am still God and can raise you up out of it. My friends, I don't know the darkness you live in. I don't know the darkness of your past. I just know this. There's an inexpressible joy in setting your face on the light that is Jesus Christ who still speaks light, life, and order over the chaos. And his word still transforms lives. So for us, the reality is a high calling. Will you get over your past and get on with your future in him? In Jesus Christ, we have a future the world cannot resist. Pray with me. Come, Lord Jesus, and speak to us, God. We, we recognize that the most unconquerable foe you have beaten in death and the grave, the most broken um, lives you have redeemed by your own living. And we ask, Lord Jesus, would you do that now? Would you come and live in us? Would you live in us in such a way that our lives are redeemed, our past is left behind, and our future is made alive in you? So God, our prayer today is simple. For those of us who don't yet know the hope of you, reveal yourself to us right now. For those of us who do know you but hold on to the past or are held on to by too many things, would you, Lord Jesus, set us free to turn our face into the wind and our eyes to the future that you hold and live faithfully held by the kinsman redeemer. Thank you, God, for the story of your great-grandmother and your grandfather, for Ruth and for Boaz, and for the way that you structured their lives to start telling the story of redemption's legacy. May that story continue right here among us today. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So isn't that the hope of it all? That our resurrected king has rendered defeated everything which seeks to oppose his new life in us. There is nothing that holds you that he cannot break. There is no past that can define your future. There is but one choice to make. Do you choose Jesus Christ and then live full tilt for him, or do you choose a watered-down version of it that makes you feel good? But one of the two is life. And I will tell you this. If you want life, it is found only in the resurrected king. Only in the redemption of all that's broken in you into all that's right with him. So as we go forward into this week, I'm going to challenge you and charge you. Make those, those redemptive introductions. Quit being owned by your past and live as though your future was bought by the high king of heaven's blood. We are the church. And let us make no excuse or apology for living as such. Amen? As we do, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace in a world that knows so much chaos, in pasts that know so much brokenness. May the peace of Christ be the badge we wear in this life that says we have a future in him alone. My friends, you are dismissed. The church must leave the building.